Carol Reed doesn't really need any introduction because she's an absolute star of the ELT world. But for those of you who need a refresh, she's an ELT expert. She's been a teacher, a teacher trainer, an academic manager. Uh, she was the president of IETFO. She's a really successful author. She wrote our series, Tiger Time, and she also wrote our new series, Wheel Wheels, which is available all over the world globally. And she'll talk today uh, about how to um, include uh, games and plays into our ELT classrooms and how to um, engage children with games and plays. So over to you, Carol. Welcome, every uh, welcome for being here with us and welcome everyone who is joining right now. Hi, Carol. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federica, for that um, lovely introduction and it's wonderful to see all of you here from so many different countries good morning good afternoon good evening it's really fantastic and play of course is an integral part of mainstream early learning programs it's natural to children and in fact as has been said it's the work of children it's the way children find out about the world the way they develop a whole range of cognitive, social, emotional and physical skills and how to communicate as well. So play enhances children's learning and development and following the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, Article 31, play is also a children's right. So the first question in this webinar that I'd like us to think about is actually what is the difference between play and games? And if you've got some ideas, if you'd like to just pop them in the chat box so that we can all share. So thinking about um, play to start off with, play, which is sometimes called make-believe play, symbolic play, free play, or pretend play, and it's the kind of play where children create imaginary situations in which they take on and act out roles. Play objects are used to represent imaginary ones and children implicitly follow a set of rules which are determined by specific roles. Play can be solitary or it can be part of a group. It can be cooperative, it can be constructive, or it can be rough and tumble. And an important feature is that it's usually child initiated. And children learn by imitating, experimenting, problem solving, making their own decisions. And a practical example might be, as the image shows here, playing house with imaginary friends and family. And this kind of play contrasts with games. Games that have specific, explicit rules and have thinking skills that are involved in following and applying the rules. And games, of course, can be competitive or cooperative, and they need compliance to the rules. If the rules are broken, the game breaks down. And a feature of games very often with this age group is that they are usually adult or teacher led. And an example might be what's missing game with pictures or flashcards. So I'd like you now to just look at the pictures here. And I'm going to ask you to put in the chat box as quick as you can which one is missing now? Which one is missing in the chat box? Can I see what's missing? Are you writing in the chat box? The absolutely. OK, the flowers. So you've got the idea. And look carefully now. And what's the next one that's missing? Are you ready? It's there. What is it? What's missing now? The slide, okay, well done. And the last one, are you ready? Looking carefully, off we go. What's missing now? The trees, okay, fantastic. And actually notice there, by the way, how I color coded the covers of the pictures as a visual clue to remember them. 
So, in free play, roles are explicit, but the rules are not. The rules can be changed and it doesn't upset the play. In games, the rules are explicit and an important characteristic of the interaction. Following the rules is essential. And initially, children often need adult support to do this. For example, learning the rules of a board game in order to be able to play independently. So play and games are both different and they both have an important role to contribute to key developmental goals in building children's English language skills as well as their overall development during the pre-primary years. So actually, what are some of those key developmental goals? And I'd like us to just now have a brief look at seven of those goals. And the first goal that we're going to start with is the goal of developing symbolic function. And symbolic function is essentially the ability to use objects, actions, words, and people to stand for something else. For example, a cardboard box is a house, or you put on a mask and you're a tiger. And following Vygotsky and social constructivist theories, this paves the way for refining everyday concepts and learning literacies based on the use of symbols in reading, writing, maths, and music, of course. And children need lots and lots of opportunities to develop symbolic function. The next goal, the next key goal that I'd like us to look at is the goal of moving from concrete to um, internal thinking. The move from children's thinking being dependent on physical objects and visual images, including letters and numbers, to being able, if you like, to think inside their heads. So for example, children first of all do a puzzle by physically manipulating the objects. And by the end of preschool, they can visualize and manipulate the objects in their mind. In kindergarten, the importance of support of objects and visual images is absolutely crucial to enable children to develop the ability to perform the act of abstraction. The next key developmental goal that I want us to look at is developing the imagination. The imagination in terms of generative mental activity in which children invent new ways of thinking about all kinds of things. With imagination, things can be changed and manipulated at will to explore possible outcomes and solve real problems and issues. And imagination, of course, gives us the basis of creative thinking, and it needs to be opened up rather than shut down in by narrow, form-focused work. Another key developmental goal in the preschool is to do with self-regulation. And what self-regulation refers to is children's ability to act in a deliberate, planned manner, gradually learning to think before acting and to control their emotions rather than have a tantler, tantrum as a toddler does. And self-regulation means that the child can do things with or without the presence of an adult. If you like, it's the beginnings of autonomy and it's also fundamental in the development of attention and concentration. Another key goal in these early years is to do with the development of positive values. Positive values towards yourself, the children's own competencies, towards others, 
and towards the environment. And of course, with values education, it's really important to start close to the child's world. So it's to do with things like re recognizing the importance of being kind, of being helpful, of making an effort, of being tidy, and so on. And the sooner we start with positive values education, the more likely we are to lay the foundations for responsible um, citizens in the future. And the next uh, key development goal for us to look at is to do with motor skills. And of course, motor skills covers two main areas. We have gross motor skills. So for example, children learning to hop, to jump, to walk on tiptoe, to be coordinated physically, and um, fine motor skills to do with writing um, letters and numbers. And this kind of physical development and the development of motor skills also underpins the way children learn and develop in other areas as well, including the seventh uh, key area that we're going to look at, which is last but not least, pre-literacy and pre-academic skills. Children's developing ability to focus attention, to concentrate, to self-regulate, as well as a range of reasoning and cognitive skills, and the development of memory, of deliberate memory, and fine motor skills, and also, of course, there, uh, the development of symbolic function in the recognition of numbers and letters. So these are key child development goals, both in children's overall uh, development and education and in language teaching. And the next key question is, how do play and games contribute to these goals? Um, and they both contribute in very important but slightly different ways. So let's have a look at that now. And I'd like to look briefly at the way um, play and games contribute to children's cognitive development, to their language development, and to CELL, which stands for social and emotional learning. And they both contribute importantly, but rather differently. So let me just highlight a few things. So for example, in terms of cognitive development, free play develops children's ability to think creatively and flexibly for an extended period. It also develops symbolic function. In other words, children's ability to use things to stand for other things. So to pretend that a ball is an apple, to pretend that a box is a phone. And as we talked about earlier, this <clears throat> de development of symbolic function underpins literacy and numeracy development. And games with rules contribute also to children's cognitive development, but in rather different ways. So for example, through games, children actually learn to be able to follow instructions. So apply the thought processes to carry out the instructions to play the game. And similarly, games develop very specific um, cognitive skills. For example, logical deduction, matching, memory, or visual observation, as we saw in the What's Missing game a little earlier. In terms of language development, free play offers a context for children to take risks and communicate using their whole language repertoire. And this contrasts with games with rules that tend to focus on the specific learning of vocabulary and language structures and offer opportunities 
for repeated practice. And our third area, social and emotional learning, free play offers opportunities for children's social development, for listening, for turn-taking, for cooperating, for developing empathy. It also offers opportunities for rehearsal at managing emotions and conflict and gives children an opportunity to develop autonomy and responsibility. Games with rules also contribute to children's social and emotional learning, but in a quite different way. Games provide experience with emotional issues, for example, resilience in the face of emotional setback, if you're not doing very well at a game, and also coping with temporary failure, perhaps when you lose a game. And games also give an opportunity for children to learn um, the, the emotional mindset and social mindset that is needed to conform to rules and norms. And also to learn about the concept of fairness and to learn to respect that. So both play and games contribute to children's development and language learning and learning language learning in general, as well as English language learning in important ways. However, I think it's true to say that in an English language teaching context, the main focus tends to be on teacher led games with rules rather than child initiated play. And I think there are a number of very understandable reasons for this. For example, free play is much more likely to be in the mother tongue or shared language. And I expect you may already have thought about this. And if we're language teachers, you know, is that a good thing for us to be encouraging? The second thing that our lessons are usually very short and we feel a pressure that they need to be used for direct teaching and input. We're following a syllabus, we're following a course book, we've got to get through it and so on. And we feel we just don't have time. A third point here is to do with children themselves, that actually in free play, some children who maybe are shyer, who don't want to play with others, they may be excluded or they may not want to participate in free play. And of course, us as teachers, we have a duty to be inclusive and make sure that everyone is involved. I think similarly, as teachers, we may feel, I know I would, a concern about management and control, that it may be difficult to control a class of however many children we have just playing freely. And the last point here, which I think is most relevant to us now in the context that we're in, that free play is actually not possible in an online context. And most of us at the moment are either teaching online or sending children work to do at home. And free play is not going to work in that context. And so given that this is an overriding issue for all of us at the moment, I would like us now to actually have a look at four areas of games which use different resources that you can play with your preschool children online and which will help you to keep children engaged and learning. And I think the important thing to say at the start of this, and we're all in this together, and actually what we know, we know how to do this in our classrooms. We know how to teach. And the most important thing for us to do at the moment is to think of our face-to-face -face practice and how we can adapt 
what we do in our face-to-face -face practice um, online. And so I'd like to look at four areas. And the first area is to do with using puppets. And I think one of the things that we notice is that when we're teaching online, one of the things that's really hard for children is that they miss the physical presence of their teacher. And of course, you can make up for that in, in lots of ways, by your warmth, by your enthusiasm, by finding out how they're getting on, by personalizing learning. But a puppet is very helpful in helping you to create a warm and effective learning climate, that the puppet becomes the children's friend. The puppet has feelings and can be happy, sad, cold, tired, etc. And over the years, I've used all kinds of different puppets. Um, some of them are in that photo. They, I took a group photo of my puppets. I've used finger puppets, pencil puppets, oven glove puppets, sock puppets. The point is, they don't need to be sophisticated. The important thing is that your puppet has a name and a personality, and that you make sure that the puppet shows interest and affection for the children. And as well as using the puppet for opening and closing routines, which are just as important online as in a, your real classroom, you can also use the puppet to demonstrate activities and also to help you manage the class. And of course, what we're talking about in this session, there are also many, many different games that you can play. So just a few examples, we might have some flashcards, three to six flashcards or objects, and we might have a little game, guess what the puppet's thinking about. And children take turns to actually guess and you name the children and they respond and you get they guess the, what, what the puppet is thinking about. You might play another game where children correct the puppet because the puppet may be a bit silly and get things wrong. So the puppet may say, the ball is blue. Oh no, Rosie, or whatever the puppet is called. The ball is red. We can also play games um, where why we get children to follow the puppet's instructions. So this can be, you know, adapted from the traditional Simon Says game, but using the puppet's name. So for example, Rosie says, wave your arms, please. Rosie says, move your head. And children know that if Rosie doesn't say please, they fold their arms and they don't do anything. And another game we might play is if we have a, a, a bag, a feely bag, or a, the puppet's bag, to actually guess what's in the puppet's bag. And a lot of these games we can also do with rhythm. So we might go, what's in the bag? Can you guess it's a ball? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so puppets then that are a, a resource that gives us lots and lots of possibilities for engaging our children online. The next area of games um, to use is using real objects. And I would just like to say that actually one of the really positive things about teaching from home is that it's much easier to get hold of real objects rather than putting them all in your bag and lugging them on the bus or the underground to school. And you can play many different games. For example, you can play a little simple guessing game. So are you ready to do this now? Um, you describe one of the objects very simply and children guess what it is. So are you ready? I want to see your answers in the chat box as quick as you can. You can eat it, it's yellow. So what is it? Yes, thank you very much, okay. Um, you can also do show and tell activities, which are actually very important for making children feel that you're really interested in them and what they brought to your online classroom 
session together. So you can ask children to bring a, an object that relates to what they're learning and show it to the class. So it might be a toy, this is my car, it's red, or it might be food, this is a potato, it's brown. And children can also show their items if they've got the, their video on, show their items very quickly and others take turns to guess what, what they are. And of course, a game that's not rocket science, um, that's a very traditional game, but works extremely well online, and we'll do this now, is a little memory game. So you see all my objects there on the tray, I hope you can remember them all. I want you to see if between you, you can name all 10 items in the chat box now. What's on the tray? Pizza, brilliant, apple, banana, chocolate, cookie, you're brilliant, yes. Okay, absolutely. Yes, lovely, fantastic, you've got it. You're super, what a lovely, you collaborating to do this activity, fantastic. Okay, so you can check your answers there. So real objects then that provide us with a range of resources for keeping our little children engaged and learning online. The next area that I think is important for us to look at is um, games with actions. And I think the important point to say here is that just as in a real classroom, children can't sit in front of a screen for long without doing something else. And so games with actions give children a physical break. And this is just as important online as it is in real life. So for example, with the image that you've got here, I might say the color, that children know the colours and children name and touch that part of the body. So for example, you can do this at home, although I can't check, okay, I say red and the children go head, okay, I say blue and they go arms, for example. We can also play um, an action game, a kind of Simon Says game using the puppet as we talked about before. Or we might also do a cumulative action game. Cumulative whereby the actions get repeated and added to each time. And this also can be made rhythmic. So for example, we might say, move your head. I hope you're all doing this at home. Move your head and your feet. We could even clap. Move your head and your feet and your arms. Move your head and your feet and your arms and your hands. Okay, lovely. So actually getting that rhythm going is also um, a good way of um, keeping children engaged. And we might also do a magic spell rhyme. And here I've got my witch puppet to show you, okay. Um, to get children to use mime and actions for other vocabulary, so not just parts of the body. And this little rhyme goes, the witch says, um, abracadabra, listen to me, you're a, and then she turns away, butterfly, one, two, three. And the minute she turns back, all the children are showing you um, that they're a butterfly. Okay, so games with actions then that we can do online, but is of course adapted from our face-to-face um, -face, um, classroom practice. And the last set of games that I want us to have a look at is, and if you use these, they're incredibly useful, using mini whiteboards. And as you can see here, um, I at the moment don't have a real mini whiteboard, so I've made one using a plastic envelope and putting paper inside. And then with washable whiteboard pens, I can draw on the plastic and clean it. And 
Children can make these at home as well. And it's a fantastic way of getting children involved in doing things during lessons, in developing their manual skills, in personalizing learning and giving them an investment and ownership of learning. So we can do some very simple things. For example, we can do show and tell kind of activities. So children might draw a picture, for example, a pet they like or from a story or the unit of work that they're doing. And they then might show and tell the class, I like the cat. Or we might have a guessing game where we guess what one child has drawn or likes. Do you like the cat? Yes, I do. No, I don't. We might use our mini whiteboards for a picture dictation, where we dictate a picture that is relevant to a unit of work or a story. And we might also include colors with that if children at home have got um, washable color pens that they can use on their whiteboards. And it's also a good idea for you to have your own whiteboard as well. And you can use this to draw a picture to introduce a topic or story. And children love guessing what you're drawing. And they also find it very funny when they see that you can't perhaps draw very well. So you can use it to introduce a topic or story. You can also use it to revise vocabulary and children guess what you're, draw what you're drawing. And it's also nice that when children do well, you can draw a smiley face or a heart on your whiteboard and show it to the, to the class to um, add to the positive feedback to children for all their efforts and make them feel that you really care about what they're doing. So we can play all these lovely teacher um, led games, um, but we also need a balance between play and games. Because from a socio-constructivist point of view, following the work of Vygotsky and others, and any of you out there who are familiar with some of the um, academic literature on early, early years and play, people like Bodrova and Moyles and Bruce, and it's child-initiated play that is considered essential for children's development and allows them to experiment and internalize thought and language. And it's through child-initiated play that children have a, have a chance to explore materials, situations, and use language for themselves and opportunities to imitate, to experiment, to take risks, to make mistakes, to have choices, solve problems, resolve conflicts, take decisions for themselves um, that help them to become more autonomous, self-regulating and responsible. All the things that actually um, lay the basis for um, developing uh, competent, responsible learners and people um, in the future. So this leads us on to the next question. How can we achieve a balance between play and games? Whether we're working as we are now online or whether when we're back in our classrooms and working face to face or whether a mixture of, of both, which who knows may be the way forward. And how can we do this? And it seems to me that the answer is essentially through the creation of formats. And here I'm very much using and building on the work of Jerome Bruner that some of you may well be familiar with. Formats is his term. And so just take a moment now, I'm not going to read it out, but just take a moment to read that definition on the screen. So, 
So formats then are essentially repeated, contextually based, interactive, conversations, games, dialogues, routines and exchanges that we use on a regular basis, actually almost all the time in class. And through repetition of formats, children become familiar with the language and procedure involved, such as exactly in the kinds of teacher-led games that we've already talked about. And when these formats are combined with regular opportunities for free play, children naturally tend to use the familiar language and procedure of the format in their own independent, playful and creative ways. In other words, all the activities and games and routines that we use in our lessons over and over again. For example, at some point, we may play a flashcard game like What's Missing with every lexical set we introduce. And rather than this being boring and repetitive for children, they love that ritual of repeating these games. And more importantly, they provide a model and scaffolding, in Bruner's term, terms, closely circumscribed formats, for children to then be able to improvise and develop their own creative versions during free play. Now, formats, in Bruner's terms, consist of a structure, roles, and a script. And your role in this process is a mediator in actually creating the structure, the role and the script and engaging children in repeated play-like activities in which children join in, memorize, internalize and subsequently use in their own free play. And we've seen lots of examples of this already. Guess what's in the puppet's bag and um, what's missing and so on. So the teacher prepares and equips children with the language they need for their own independent play. And when the independent play happens, the teacher also, and these are the arrows at the bottom here, the teacher gets feedback from how the children are learning. And this feeds in to the evaluation process and of how effective that you're being. So actually, how do um, formats work in practice? And let's have a look. And you'll actually see that this is very much the kind of um, practice that we've already talked about in all those teacher-led games with puppets, mini whiteboards, real objects, um, and so on. Let's have a look, though, at two examples. So the first example, an action game using a puppet. And you can see there on the left, the structure. Now, what Bruna means by the structure what he calls this, is a set of realisation rules by which the game is managed. So basically, what essentially that means is basically the procedure. So actually the, the process you go through as you do the activity. The roles, the teacher and the puppet in this case also, have different roles. So the teacher puppet leads and the children follow. And the script for the interaction. In this case, it's a little action rhyme. So it goes, follow, follow, follow me. Walk, walk, walk. One, two, three. Follow, follow, follow me. Jump, jump, jump. One, two, three, and so on. So you can see it's a very closely circumscribed, scripted um, interaction. Let's have a look 
at another example now, and one in a way that we've already talked about with guess what's in the puppet's bag. And here we can see that the structure is um, the teacher puts objects in a feely bag, starts taking one out, or the puppet can take one out without the children teaching, and then the children guess. So the roles there, the teacher leads and the children guess. And the script in this case is what's in the bag? Can you guess? It's a ball. Yes, yes, yes. No, it isn't. Yes, you're right. Very good. All that kind of language. And of course, in our classes, as children become familiar with um, games like this, um, we begin to give them opportunities, confident ones at first, to actually take turns to lead the activity and ask the question. And in Bruno's terms, this would be described as employing what he calls the handover principle. In other words, for a reciprocal increase in the children's responsibility for the activity. And this is also a crucial part of the scaffolding process, the support that we give for children's learning. And so children are increasingly able to play in an independent way as you step back. And of course, that's often the aim of what we do in our classes. We start off leading up front and gradually take a more backseat role as children have the language and competence um, and familiarity to be able to carry out the activity themselves. But that's still not quite free play. So what can we do? How can we provide opportunities for free play in our classes? And I think there are three options depending on our circumstances. And let's have a look at those options now and also the pros and cons of each one. So to start off with, um, English learning areas. And English learning areas, sometimes also called English corners, are learning centres linked to English and they reflect what's happened for years in many mainstream contexts of pre-primary practice where in a preschool classroom there might be a reading area with cushions, a construction area with modelling bricks, a house area, a shop area, where children at various moments during the day can choose to interact and play with age-appropriate instructional toys and materials. And an English language area, if you're having an English area as well and adding to that, it needs to be resourced with materials that reflect what children have done in the class with their teacher. And the importance of this is that this triggers children's memories of what they've done in a teacher-led activity. So it can include things like flashcards, um, the puppet, story cards, and um, small picture cards maybe that go with the story. Um, it might also include a tablet and headphones to listen to particular songs. And the idea is that an English language area provides opportunities for children to play and experiment with familiar resources and to interact with their peers in an autonomous, child-led way. However, there are real problems of using English language areas for English language teaching, because these English learning areas happen outside your class time or lesson time. They need the close collaboration with the class teacher and their buy-in, if you like, to the value of having an English learning area. But even if the class teacher agrees, they, they may not speak English, 
They may not know what you've been doing in class or what to look out for as the children use the English language area. Another crucial drawback is that you as the language teacher are never there to be able to observe what happens in children's free playtime because you're off teaching somewhere else. So you never get direct feedback on the ways that children play and use the language. Another really practical issue is that it's difficult for you to leave your resources, such as flashcards and a puppet, in one class, because normally we only have one set of these kinds of things and we need them for our other teaching elsewhere. And of course, if, as some of you may be, if you're teaching in a private language school, the children are only there for their lessons and there aren't other opportunities for free play. So although they can work very well, there are those drawbacks. And a way to resolve this is actually to set up learning stations, or sometimes called learning hubs, during lessons. And learning stations provide meaningful, self-directed language play for children and develop skills such as autonomy, responsible decision-making and cooperation during lessons. A learning station might include um, the class puppet and a set of flashcards, okay? It might be more narrowly resourced than the learning areas we talked about. Or it might include story cards and small picture cards or paper and um, crayons. And in my experience, it's best to start off with just one or two stations and then possibly add to them one new at a time. And the idea is that children take turns to alternate, for example, completing an activity sheet at their tables to visiting the learning stations that you've set up in small pairs, in small pairs, in small groups or pairs. And if you're working with a course book, at the end of each unit, you may like to devote a whole lesson or even two lessons to children taking turns to visit and play at different learning stations with the resources that you've used for that particular um, unit of work and that they are familiar with. Now, the benefits of learning stations are that as they're organized during lesson time, they provide you with a golden opportunity to work with and give extra support to small groups of children who are not at the learning station in turn. It's, I would say, of key importance for you not to interfere with children's play at the learning stations. You certainly don't want to worry what language it's going on in because it will be partially in the children's shared language or mother tongue and some of it will be um, in English. But the important thing to do is to actually eavesdrop as you can and this gives you important feedback on how children play and how, they're, and how they're learning. The time is obviously limited by your lesson length and children may not have more than five minutes or so at a learning station, but there are the same advantages as English learning areas of autonomy, responsibility, etc. And you yourself can observe how children tend to, and it's really wonderful the way this happens, because they tend to replicate activities that they've done in class. Okay, so if they've played the what's missing game, they will do it with the flashcards and the puppets. They tend to use chunks of language that they've learned. So they will say very good to each other and things like that. They tend to correct and help each other. 
In other words, they tend to scaffold each other's learning, and they also can be very strict with each other if they get it wrong. And from what I've seen over the years, one of the favorite activities of children at learning stations is playing the teacher. So they take turns to take the role of being the children and the teacher. Well, of course, at the moment, it's all very well to talk about English learning areas and learning stations, but we can't do any of that at the moment because we're not at school and we're working online. And so this, I think, is an opportunity for um, the third option here. And the third option is actually in the home. And so this is an opportunity for us to communicate with parents at home. So actually parents understand the importance of providing children with opportunities to play with the resources or similar ones to those that you've used in online lessons um, with their whiteboards, for example, with different objects, um, with pictures and, 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 and so on. And children to either play on their own or possibly also with siblings. There's nothing like older siblings taking the role of the teacher with their younger um, brothers or, or sisters. And that in a way is how at the moment we can provide this bridge between our teacher-led um, activities and formats during our online lessons and opportunities for taking it away from the classroom and using it in the children's own real play. So children need repeated exposure to formats in teacher-led activities and games, dialogues, songs, routines and stories. We've only been talking about games and play today, but it applies to all these things in order to build children's confidence and ownership of language and to enable free play to happen in a child-initiated way. And actually what happens then that children will naturally play at least partially in English. They may, for example, name some of the vocabulary items, say very good, things like that. It's bound to be a mix of languages, but that is also totally natural and is not something that we should interfere with. But it is the process of children gradually taking on the ownership of language and internalizing it. So coming to the end of the session now, let's just have a quick look at what we've talked about in this session. We started off by talking about the differences between play and games. We looked at seven, if you remember, key attainment goals in pre-primary. We then discussed how play and games contribute to these goals in rather different ways. We also saw why completely understandably it's games that tend to predominate in English language teaching. We then had a look at the kinds of games we can use to teach children online and keep our young learners, very young children, I mean, younger than young, the very youngest, engaged in learning. We then looked at the importance of providing a balance between play and games and how to achieve this through formats. We saw examples of formats in practice. And finally, we had a look at possible options for provision of free play through English learning areas or learning stations or home. So I guess my final message of this session is use a balance of teacher-led activities and games with opportunities for child-initiated play for 
enjoyable learning and successful results. So that really brings me to the end of my sessions, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. If you have any questions for me, uh, let me know. Any questions there in the chat box? Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Carol, for the, a great the, the comments are going so quickly, I can hardly see the questions. Can you hear me, Carol? Are there any questions, Federica? Have you found some? Yeah, can you hear me? So if you can hear me, I've it's got... It's amazing. A... It's going so quickly. I don't have a chance to see them. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> running very fast. So if you can hear me, Carol. Yes, I've got... I can. Great. I've got a couple of questions that popped up uh, a few times. And I think they can relate to each other. So they were, um, what would you advise to teachers who have uh, children who don't want to play or are a bit unresty and can't really sit still for uh, a little time? Uh, how would you engage them? Uh, I think you have to try to use as much variety as possible. I think the key is no obligation. I think with little children, the secret is to lead them. You know that, that saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I think that is the same with um, very young children and language learning and that actually that will be counterproductive. So you need to use a range of resources because different children are attracted by different elements. So it may be you know, a movement game that attracts, it may be music, it may be story. I think you have to um, you know, try, try different ways and, and no obligation. I think at this age, if children are really resistant to coming to a session online, it probably shouldn't be obligatory. But the key thing would be for you to make it so attractive and so fun and to convey the warmth of your care and interest for the children that they actually want to be there. Thank you. Uh, there is another question that I think is uh, links very well to this one. And it was, how often do you think games should be changed uh, in order to keep students engaged? Uh -huh. Well, I think the younger the children are, the more they need to be changed. I mean, I used to have a, a thing for myself when I was um, teaching, you know, 30 minute lessons with um, three year olds. And I used to think, actually, I need a different activity for every minute of the class. <laughs> so perhaps that's exaggerating a little bit. But the truth of the matter is that young children have very short attention spans. And so there does need to be a lot of variety. This is not to say that when their interest is engaged, they can actually focus for quite a long time. Um, but I think you do, yes, you need lots of ideas up your sleeve. And the secret always is to stop playing a game while the children are still loving it, you know, because then, because they, then they want more. And if you go on that bit too long and they want to do something else, then, then you've lost them. So always stop at the top of that curve where they're still having a great time. Thank you, Carol. Uh, another question was about how to uh, start um, engaging children with reading, especially through games, uh, when they're at their very first stage of approach to reading and writing as well. I think this is a very good question and I think um, I would also want to do it through in a game, in a ludic, a play-like way. So, for example, you know, we might do, I just off the top of my head, you know, a bingo game using 
words or short sentences instead of pictures. And so this would actually naturally engage the children in reading, but in a in a context that is not like a chore and something that they have to do because because it's a game that they're going to be playing. So I think I would I would I would want to do to try and do that. Thank you. So if you have any more questions, do type them into the chat box because I'm reading them all and I'm uh, asking them to Carol. So there's Gonzalo who's asking for a oh, few tips. Yeah. On, uh, no, no, absolutely. Gonzalo is asking for a few tips on how to get started. So he said he's just um, finished his studies. So he's about to start teaching for the first time. And if you could give him some tips on how to succeed as a language teacher of ch children. Okay, well, are we talking about succeeding as a language teacher of children <laughs> online or in real life? I mean, I think, I mean, the, the, the main fundamental tip is to um, have, to, to value your children, to recognize the learning potential of all of them and to tune in to where they are because it's only by tuning in to where the children are that you can then lead them to another place because in a way you're a bit like the Pied Piper of Hamelin except you're not leading them into a horrible cave but you're, you want to find the music that they will follow um, and it's it's by listening to the children that that you find that that you find that so that would be that would be a main tip thank you and good luck gonzalo uh, well done for finishing your studies thank you carol there was another question uh, it's pinned at the top of the chat box and it says is there any possibility to do error analysis through games uh, well, I think there definitely is. I mean, I think, and I think it's really important to observe the way that children play games and the language that they use to play games. I mean, I'm not sure how at this age, in terms of error analysis, you know, and in terms of unpacking the grammar, we're not really talking about that because actually with this age group, they're learning chunks of language, which are like, you know, say for example, I don't know, which is like a few connected words that they learn as a single concept. They don't even necessarily realize that that's three words, never mind, you know, a negative and a verb and a so on. So, but certainly, observation and awareness of the way our children are using language is hugely important in giving us um, feedback about how effective we're being and how we might do better in our teaching. Thank you. Um, another few people are asking, other few people are asking uh, how to evaluate and assess kids uh, when teaching online and especially through games and can we involve any of their parents or um, older siblings in doing this goodness me that is that is a very big question kind of evaluation online i, f I feel really wary of that actually how because it is obviously providing such a partial snapshot of what a child is doing. I mean, if you're having a child for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, even 45 minutes online, and children come, they're in a particular mood, you know, maybe things haven't gone well for them. So actually, you can get a snapshot of how they're doing like that. But over the, over the longer term, I think you would need, you know, to use a range of, of other um, instruments, if you like, to evaluate. And I think although it's really important to communicate clearly with parents about your um, learning aims and intentions and give them ways 
to support their learning, the last thing you want to do is to make parents feel that they must put pressure on their children of this age to, to achieve. So I, I think it's something that in, in our present circumstances, um, I would feel quite wary of wanting to do in any way that might have a negative washback effect on children's motivation and participation, because that's what's key with this age group. You know, if, if they don't want to participate, if they don't feel they love it at this age, how are they going to feel when they're 10? Very true. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question because we also had Carol on this morning. Um, so Nalini is asking, should we follow a timetable when teaching preschool or should we just go with the flow? Uh, so I think uh, they mean, should we uh, schedule very precisely our classes or should we go with the flow? Uh, I'm not sure what the go with the flow means because um, I mean, I think if you're if you're organizing a, a classroom on a platform where everyone needs to be at the same time, then I guess parents, because parents come with their children at this age group, they are with their children, that they need to know that in advance. And I think, so my advice would be that, yes, actually to have that regular event happening is something that hopefully children would look forward to. And ideally, I saw another question going by about the length of sessions. And I would ideally say that the sessions would be quite short. Um, and they would also end with, or not end, but as a result of those sessions, children would have something to do that they would then bring back to the next session so that you would provide that continuity. I don't know if that answers the question. I think, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, I think it definitely did. Um, I think maybe the main structure uh, and as someone was saying, it's really important to plan your classes. Uh, so you, especially when you're teaching online, I don't know if you agree on that. Oh, I think it's really, I think it's really important. But I think it's also important to be aware that time does very strange things online, that actually, you know, it takes you much longer to start your class. Um, children arrive at different times. You need to greet them. You need to make them feel welcome. You need to ask how they are. You know, their parents may be there. You maybe need to greet them. So this all takes quite a long time, as does um, setting up activities or even doing a simple you know guess what's in the puppet bag that time works in a slightly different way and depending on the number of children that you have and the length of session you will as you get used to it you get you'll get a feel for um the time that things take thank you carol thank you also for a really really great session it was really heartwarming to see your enthusiasm and we've been getting great feedback already. Thank you everyone for attending. It's been such a pleasure to have all of you here with us. Uh, thanks to Mike Riley who organized this webinar and who's the person behind all of the webinar program. We wouldn't have the webinars without Mike. He's in the room with us so he can hear us. Thanks Mike. And he can read us as well. Thanks once again, Carol. It's been absolutely great. And we're yes. honestly honored to have up all of you with us thank you Federica and thank you for all the all the lovely comments I've seen going in the chat box it's really been really lovely to be with you all and to feel connected with so many teachers working all over the world and best of luck with what you're doing exactly bye, yeah bye Carl thank you again mm -hmm.